When GM announced the E-Ray in early 2023, it put a major twist in the Corvette Purist collective jorts. And Chevy basically knocked their new balances off when they confirmed an electric Corvette was on the books for 2025. But it turns out, this is not the first time the Corvette has had electric power. In 1993, years before GM put the EV1 into production, there was an all-electric Corvette prototype, built in total secrecy by one of the world's biggest and most influential companies with technology that was decades ahead of its time. The car was almost lost to history until it was discovered at an Illinois salvage yard. This is the story of the lost Corvette EV built by Motorola. Everything we know about the Motorola Corvette today is thanks to journalist Kevin Williams, who found the car, tracked down the original engineering team, and brought the story to light in an amazing three-part series that we ran here on The Drive. His incredible stories are linked in the description below. The story starts in 1975 with a frustrated electrical engineer, Sanjar Game. Gas prices had reached a whopping 57 cents a gallon, and Game set about relieving this massive expense by laying out the basic framework for his first electric vehicle. While his first attempt at converting a car resulted in what could be referred to as a glorified golf cart, it did spark Game's interest in electric vehicle technology. These early experiments led to Game's future endeavors at Motorola, where he became the new director of automotive technology, pursuing the potential he saw in electric powertrains. In the 1980s, cars were becoming more computerized, and Game wanted Motorola to prepare for this new tech-forward future by investing in EV technology. Now, you may know Motorola for its mid-2000s extra-slim phones, but in the 1980s, Motorola was making microprocessors for Apple, Atari, HP, and even the automotive industry. Motorola was exploring technology across many verticals, and Game apparently wanted this to include electric Corvettes. Now, this isn't the first time that the Corvette has been a testbed vehicle. Chevy had been experimenting on them in-house for years. The idea of a mid-engine Corvette had been tried out as early as the 1950s. It began in 1959 with the CERV, Chevrolet Engineering Research Vehicle, and then again with the CERV2. But GM quickly pulled the plug on all racing activities before the CERV2 ever saw the light of day. From then on, unconventional engine placements gained a poor reputation within the company, but Determined to make the third generation Corvette a mid-engine sports car, the XP880 Astro II came onto the scene. It debuted at the New York Auto Show in 1968, the same year that the first units of the long-lived C3 Corvette arrived in showrooms. But Game wasn't looking to build a GM show pony. He was determined to build a running, ready-for-the-road EV. Something drivable, reasonable, and even marketable in the 90s. The EV market is still a tough sell, but back then, he would need a plan and enough financial backing to make this more than a golf cart with a body kit. From his lofty position at Motorola, Game had access to plenty of sharp-minded engineers. Game was able to convince a fellow Motorola colleague, Ken Gerbitz, to join him in his electric-powered endeavor. And alongside a hand-picked group of fellow engineers and tinkerers, they started planning the impossible how to build an electric demo vehicle impressive enough to convince their bosses that electric powertrains had value. He had a team, a dream, and next he needed the money. Luckily, his team of engineers had some connections, and I'm not just talking about wiring. Game's team got an opportunity to dip their toes into the EV world when they learned about a crew in Arizona that needed help building an electric race car for the Solar and Electric 500 race. The crew had limited resources, but once the Motorola team joined up, they built a race car dubbed the EX11. The EX11 weighed in at a Civic-like 2100 pounds, and it was powered by a modified GE motor that managed to produce a Civic-like 75 horsepower constant with 135 horsepower at peak output. In fact, the team set a world record for the fastest EV on a closed course at 100 miles an hour, beating even the entries from Toyota and even GM themselves. Considering how limited the resources were for the EX11, the team had truly proven that they could move forward with an EV project of their own. 
In fact, the win was enough for Motorola Vice President Fred Tucker, an automotive enthusiast himself, to fund the project with $25,000, which, eh, even in the 90s, is not a lot in terms of developing an entire car. But now, Game had the team, the dream, and at least some money from the bosses at Motorola. All they needed was a car for the project. And this is where the Corvette comes in. The car they chose to convert was going to have to be impressive enough to prove to Tucker and the rest of the Motorola bosses that EV tech was worth pursuing at a time when the market was non-existent. This car would need to stand out. It would need to be something people would actually want to drive, even if it was gonna be electric. And while the project had been funded with a measly $25,000, that purse came with some serious strings attached. For one, the project would need to remain secret. Why? Uh, we don't know for sure, but it's likely that it was kept under wraps because if it didn't work, it's like it never happened. No bad press for Motorola, lower risk. The next caveat was that if the project was going to achieve the goal of showing off what electric powertrains could really do, it also needed to showcase Motorola technology. So if it did work, Motorola could not only take credit for building an electric vehicle, but also highlighting its existing Motorola parts that were on sale at the time. The third stipulation was that the team also had to build a follow-up to their EX11 race car. Luckily, there was a separate budget for this, but it also meant an additional project to manage. Even with that, Game and Gerbitz knew this was the chance they needed to prove that EVs could work. With everything in place, they set to work, and what better starting point than a C4 Corvette? Game had owned a Corvette before and thought it would be a great fit for the project. The C4 had sleek aerodynamic lines and more advanced technologies than previous models. It also featured composite materials like fiberglass and plastic, reducing the weight without compromising structural integrity, which was going to be important if you were going to be adding a significant amount of weight in the form of batteries. The C4 also introduced more modernized electronics, including digital instrument clusters, advanced audio systems, and electronic climate control, which really gave the project a good jumping off point for integrating Motorola's tech. Tom Bronner from the successful EX11 team found a non-running red 1987 Chevrolet Corvette convertible, and the team began preparing it for conversion in Arizona. While the EX11 team stripped the chassis, Games Team was designing and engineering bespoke motors, controllers, and necessary EV equipment back in the Chicagoland area. To streamline the process, the Corvette build ended up sharing a lot of design aspects with the new EX12 race car. This seemed like the best way to satisfy all of Motorola's corporate requirements, but there were more strings where that came from. The EX12 and the Corvette each needed a power source, and due to sponsorship agreements probably not made by the engineers, the power source had to be Exide lead acid batteries. While battery chemistry of the time hadn't quite reached what it is now, the team could have used more powerful nickel cadmium batteries that they had originally tested, which had gotten the C4 to over 400 horsepower. That's more than a base Tesla Model 3 today, and this was in the 90s. But again, the team had to please their corporate overlords, so Exide's lead acid batteries were used instead, bringing the peak horsepower down significantly. While the team was building the EX12 to win a race, the C4 needed to be quick while also showing off Motorola's gadgetry. The Corvette acted as a test bed for Motorola's motor, motor controller, and battery tech, with the sponsored Exide batteries being easily accessible for quick swapping. Ken's brother, Bob Gerbitz, also an engineer, designed the custom powertrain for both the C4 and the EX12, plus another set for a Chevy S10 outfitted for battery research. Yes, you can add that to the long list of secret projects this team had to work on simultaneously. Gerbitz's job was complicated, to say the least. He had to design and write algorithms to make all the motor controller components work, and all of this was custom for each build. The crew also had to design and build the power electronics, the microprocessor board, and program the systems. Even with the less powerful batteries, the EX12 and the Corvette each had a combined system voltage of 336 volts, feeding an 800 amp motor controller. The motor spun at an impressive 10,000 RPM, and 
delivered 157 horsepower continuously, peaking at 272 horsepower, which is more than the 87 Corvette made with its 5.7 liter V8. The EX12 reached 160 miles an hour, and it was so fast, GM allegedly paid to prevent it from showcasing at the 1994 Kart Grand Prix in Cleveland. But back to our converted C4. The conversion to battery power brought its curb weight up to approximately 3,800 pounds, or about 500 pounds heavier than the Corvette had been originally. Heavier, but still in the realm of feasibility for a convertible sports car. In fact, that's about what a convertible Mustang GT weighs today. Pretty impressive for a cell phone company. Because of the Exide batteries, the C4 only had a range of about 50 miles, but because the batteries were swappable, it didn't need to sit around and charge between tests. How come Motorola can figure this out, but Tesla, Rivian, and Polestar all want you to sit at a Denny's parking lot for 45 minutes? The team at Motorola had managed to bring all of the complicated custom-built pieces together into what looked like a stock C4. Because the motor was mounted in the engine bay, it still put power to the rear wheels through the original manual transmission. Gerbitz told us it drove beautifully and could light up the tires in any gear. It's sort of a beautiful thing. Unless you pop the clamshell hood, you wouldn't know the creation was an EV at all. After some successful drives, trying out the charging capabilities, and generally putting the car through its paces, the team deemed the project a success. In less than a year, Game and his crew had gone from envisioning electric cars to setting a new speed record and building two advanced, fully functional EVs that were setting the pace for electrification light years ahead of even the big manufacturers. So what happened? Why did we only hear about this project two years ago? Well, much like the batteries that powered it, the project eventually ran out of juice. Internally at Motorola, resistance was starting to grow. And yes, that is an electricity joke. As the project grew, many more people started getting involved. While the project was secret, it was easy to streamline. But now everybody wanted to give their input and game had too many cooks in the kitchen. Motorola was also undergoing larger personnel and operational changes at the time. With the new CEO taking office in 1993 and the retirement of one of the EV Corvette's biggest early supporters, the Motorola executives began rethinking the value of the project. The costs of the next stage of bringing the Corvette into development began to mount, and the new management made it clear they weren't really convinced about the viability of electric cars in the future. They were busy thinking about razor thin phones or something. In a Hail Mary play to save his project, Game invited the new CEO to see the Corvette and in pure Carol Shelby style, let the executive take the C4 for a spin. Even though Motorola's COO was excited after driving the C4, the timeline for production was just too unrealistic with Game projecting another 15 to 20 years for something market ready. Not long after the executive's joyride, the electric Corvette and the EX12 race car projects were both canceled. Motorola executives might have said they didn't want to continue product development, but when it came down to it, they didn't believe EVs were the future. And today we're still having that argument. Yes, plenty of EVs have hit the market and become more usable as technology advances, but we've also unearthed the problems with EV infrastructure and converting the existing system over to an EV-based one. Plus, no matter how fast an EV is or how good it looks, it still doesn't tug at your heartstrings the way that Corvette's original V8 would have. The team at Motorola chose a Corvette for a reason. It's a car that's just plain fun to drive. It's the same reason that Tesla used a Lotus Elise as the basis for the original Roadster. Motorola could have become an early player in the EV world, but sadly, the EV C4 never got its due. It eventually landed in the Motorola Campus Museum, then bought by the museum director himself, then it changed hands again before ending up stashed in a nondescript warehouse at a local salvage yard where Kevin Williams found it in non-running condition in 2022 after following a tip. Since we published those stories, the Motorola Corvette has been sold again, this time to a British engineer named Idris Hamadi, who has been hard at work trying to get it running and driving again. Will it live up to the original potential that Motorola squashed? Well, Idris doesn't have sponsors to please or corporate egos to feed, so who knows? Anything's possible. And that's really what this project was. It asked what was possible. What could dreamers do with a wild idea and a rear wheel drive convertible? 
it could have put Motorola into the automotive spotlight at the forefront of electrification. And while it may not have led directly to the production of an electric Corvette, the concepts of swappable batteries, AC motors, and the preservation of the stock look were pretty cool innovations. Who knows what advances that ragtag team in the 90s could have made with a little more budget, support, and time. While we wait to see what GM's version of an EV Corvette really is, it's kind of wild to know that thanks to a scrappy team working in secret, they're 30 years behind the curve. That's all from me. If you didn't notice, I'm not actually Kyle, but he will be back on your screens in two weeks with another story. Thanks for watching.